So most of you guys know, but I love board games. I'm obsessed with board games. I have a closet full of board games. I love playing Ticket to Ride and Settlers of Catan and uh, Carcassonne and all these other weird sounding board games. And I love the rule books for board games. And so when I get a new board game, I bring out the rule book and I'm just like a nerd sitting there reading the rule book and I'm like learning this new game system. And I'm like, I'm so excited to play this. And uh, the thicker the rule book, the better. And I brought some examples here with me of some of these rule books that I love. And when Darby was going to buy me a Christmas present this year, she went down to Showcase Comics in Bryn Mawr. And uh, they sell board games down there. And she went in and she said, I want to buy a board game for my husband. And it needs to have a thick rule book because he loves when it has giant rule books and has lots of rules. And so she ended up buying me this board game about surviving the zombie apocalypse. And there's all these rules and alternate rules. And it's like a super long rule book. And I loved it. And as soon as I got it, I start reading it and reading about it. And uh, I just, I like rule books. And that's great for a board game. It's not so great when you approach the Bible. And I think a lot of people, when they think about the Bible, they think this is the rule book and you have to play by the rules. They think of life as a game and the Bible is the rule book uh, for life. That by obeying this book, you win at life. And so they use this book like they would use a rule book. And so, you know, when you're playing a board game and you have a question about one of the sections of the game, you flip to the section of the rule book that's going to apply to that. And that's how a lot of people use their Bibles. They think, okay, well, I need to find this subject. So you do a quick Google search. You're like, oh, it talks about it here. You flip open. You look at the rule for that, uh, for that subject, and you kind of move on. And they don't look at the overarching story of the Bible, and they just kind of pull out this one section that they think applies to where they're at. No one reads a rule book for a board game to find out about the game designer. But God designed the Bible not so that we would get rules for life, but so that we would know him, the designer of life. We read rule books to play the game, but God wants us to read the Bible to know him. And so I think there's really two ways of looking at the Bible. If you went out here and you talked to anybody in America, there's really two ways of looking at the Bible. It's either a love letter or it's a rule book. And I think the majority of people talk about this book and use this book like it's a rule book. But I think it's a love letter. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you why I think it's a love letter and why we should use it as a love letter instead of a rule book. And you say, Alex, why would anybody want to make the Bible a rule book if it's a love letter? Love letters are better. Like if I was going to hand you something, would you rather get something, let me, let me back up, not from me, but somebody who, that you are in a relationship with, would you rather them walk up to you and give you a love letter or give you a rule book and say, hey, this is going to be our prenup, or would you rather have a love letter? I'd rather get the love letter than the prenup, right? But so you say, Alex, why would anyone make the Bible a rule book if it's not a rule book? I think we make it into a rule book because we like to keep score. We like to keep score. We like to know that we're winning because if you're keeping score, then you can say, oh, I'm doing a little bit better than they are. I'm beating them. I'm winning. And we love to win. We love to beat someone else. And I think the reason that we make this into a rule book is so we can say, huh? You're only about a 30 on the spiritual scale, but I'm a 50. I'm winning. I'm beating you. I'm scoring, and you're not. And, uh, you know, I always think it's funny. People are so obsessed with the Ten Commandments. They take up a relatively small section of the Bible in this obscure back part of the Old Testament, but people are obsessed with them. Everybody knows the Ten Commandments. I'll talk to people who aren't religious at all, who have no church background, who don't know anything about the Bible, and they know a bunch of the Ten Commandments, and they talk about the Ten Commandments. I was talking to a guy the other day, and he says, I'm not religious at all, and he was asking me about why our church was involved at the Mainline Arts Center, and I started talking to him about the ways we serve there, and he says, the only thing I know about the Bible is the Ten Commandments. I was like, isn't that funny? Everybody knows about the Ten Commandments, and we had a team come up last summer from the South, a group of young people who helped us serve uh, through the community, and uh, I was asking them, I said, what's the most important part of the Bible? Because I was talking to them about how to have conversations with people as they're in our community. And uh, they went around and said some things. What I wanted them to say was Jesus and the story of Jesus, that he invites everyone to live and love like he did to become a student of his life. 
And here's what several of them said to me. The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is the most important part. Why are we obsessed with the Ten Commandments? I think it's because it's one of the only parts of the Bible that sound like a rule book. You know? And so we're like instantly drawn to that because we want the Bible to be a rule book. But you read a rule book differently than you read a love letter, right? If I hand you a rule book, you're not going to read that the same way as if a lover hands you a letter. I hope you don't. You should read them differently. A rule book, when you read it, you're asking yourself, what do I have to do? What must I do to obey the rules? A love letter, instead, when you read that, you're asking this question, who does my lover say that I am? A rule book says, what must I do? And a love letter says, who does my lover think I am? A rule book is going to use guilt to compel you to obey. If you don't play by the rules, you're a cheater. Have you ever, um, somebody's won a game, and uh, you're like, you didn't earn that, you're a cheater. And then all of a sudden, yeah, yeah, Darby always wins every board game we ever play. Um, my sister and I used to play board games with my grandma and my grandpa, and they're passed away now. But these were the most ruthless, cutthroat game players I've ever met in my life. They would, I mean, if it came down to saving my life or winning at a board game, they'd be like, let my grandchild die because I must win at this game. They were relentless. And so I remember we used to play Uno with my grandma and grandpa, and I mean, they were cutthroat. They would like, it was no like, oh, you're my grandchild, I'll let you win. They were like, draw four, draw four, draw four, draw. They'd stack them up, you know? And so my sister and I, Rachel, we decided we're gonna beat them no matter what it takes. And so what we started doing was we devised all these ways to cheat. And so we would shove cards through the crack in the table, you know? And so at the end of the game, like 40 of our cards from our hand were under the table. We would like um, pick up, even though we had something to lay down until we got a draw four, so we could put it on our grandparents. And we eventually beat them, but only because we cheated. And so at the end of it, we were like, we won, but there's no satisfaction, right? So a rule book, forces you to obey the rules because if you don't, you feel like a cheater. You feel like you didn't earn it. But a love letter compels you not to obey, but to become because of who your lover already thinks you are. I had this coworker in Tennessee when I worked at the insurance company and she was this wise, wise woman. And she, she had been married all these years and I wasn't married yet, I was engaged and so I would ask her questions and she said this, don't tell your spouse what they are. Tell them who you see that they could become. And she says, my husband used to be so lazy. And I was like, oh, I'd never heard you say anything bad about your husband. And she says, I started saying, I am so grateful for every small thing that you do. I am so grateful for all that you do. And she says, the more I told him how thankful I was that he was so hardworking and that he did so much, she said, he began to do more and more and more until now he jumps at anything to do it. And I think that when our lover tells us who they think we already are, it makes us long to become that. A rule book says, I need to do this, or otherwise I'm going to feel guilty. A lover says, I think you already are this, and you can become it even more. And over and over again in scripture, God uses the language of a lover in the Bible. He doesn't use the language of a rule book. That's why you don't flip open the Bible and say, oh look, this is the section on God. This is the section on behaviors of, of our marriage. This is the section on work. Instead, it's just a stream of stories and poems and letters and thoughts. Why? Because it's a love letter, not a rule book. And here's some of the examples of the language of love that God uses throughout the Old and New Testament. In Jeremiah 3.20, God says to Israel, I feel like I am the husband and you've been an unfaithful woman who has cheated on me. You have been unfaithful to me. In the book of Hosea in the Old Testament, God tells Hosea, a prophet, he says, I want you to go marry a prostitute. And Hosea is like, what? What are you talking about? Go marry a prostitute? And God says, yes, because Israel has treated me like they're a prostitute and they've been sleeping around with other people and haven't been faithful to me. And so Hosea goes down and marries this prostitute. He brings her into his house. It doesn't take her very long before she's out working the streets again. And she actually gets picked up in some human trafficking and she's being sold in the marketplace as a uh, sex slave. And Hosea goes down 
buys her back, even though she's already his wife, and brings her back home. And God says, I want you to use this as an example of how Israel has treated me and how I'm buying them back. And you say, whoa, like God is using this very graphic language to talk about this nation, not in a term of a rule relationship, but in terms of a love relationship. And the same thing happens in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians 11.2, it says, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, and I promise to you one husband, that is Christ, that I may present you as a pure virgin to him. And so Paul is talking about the church, the followers of Jesus Christ, and he uses this picture that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is a virgin bride who is waiting for Jesus. And we see in Revelation 19, 17, uh, 7, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory, for now it is the wedding of the Lamb. The Lamb is the picture of Jesus, and his bride has made herself ready. And so we have this picture of Jesus and the followers of Jesus coming together and having this great celebration. And the Bible uses this imagery of marriage. And so over and over again, the Bible talks about itself as being a love letter with love language and not rule language. We could go on and on because there's example after example after example. See, we should read the Bible like I read old love letters from Darby, not like I read a rule book for how to play a board game. The number one reason that I think people misuse this book is because they think it's a rule book and not a love letter. They think it's a rule book and not a relationship book. This is a relationship book, not a rule book. And so all the time when you see people on social media or maybe in your life or maybe in churches and you see them using the Bible and you're like, is that right? Like how they're using that seems a little bit off. Why is that? It's because they think it's a rule book and not a relationship book. And when religious leaders approached Jesus in Matthew 22, they came up to Jesus and they said, okay, traveling rabbi, traveling teacher, since you're so smart, tell us this, what is the most important role in this book? And Jesus was so clever with him. He said this, the most important role is this, love God and love others. And so he subverted their question. He gave them a role because they wanted a role. But what did he talk about? He talked about two relationships. He said, you're wrong about the whole book. The book is not about roles, it's about relationships. And so he answered their question and gave them roles because that's what they wanted. But at the same time, he undermined their very question and said, it's not about roles. It's about our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. If you use the Bible primarily to tell other people how they're wrong, you're misusing it. You think it's a rule book and not a relationship book. It's not about settling disputes. That's not why God gave us the Bible, so that you could get on social media and be like, hey, so-and-so, you're wrong. That's not why he gave us the Bible. He gave us a Bible so that we could know and experience his love. Without the Bible, we wouldn't know the incredible lengths that God went through for us to know him and to enjoy his love. Now, growing up in church, I heard people refer to the Bible as an acronym, which is completely wrong. Here's what the acronym that they would say. They took the letters and they said, the Bible means basic instructions before leaving earth. People used to always say this at some of the churches I was at. Did anyone ever hear this? No, good. I'm glad you, you didn't hear that. That's not what the Bible means. The word Bible is not an acronym at all. The word Bible comes from the Latin word Biblia, which means, does anybody know? It means books. <laughs> That's what the Bible means. When you say Bible, what you're literally saying is, books. Hand me that books because it's multiple books packaged into one. Now that word, that Latin word comes from a Hebrew word, biblos, which means scrolls. <laughs> so when you're saying Bible, what you're saying is hand me those scrolls, hand me those books. So it's not an acronym and this acronym is not a good description of the Bible and I'll tell you why. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 25, it says this, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers. What was the empty way of life? Rule keeping. We're going to talk about that in a minute. He says, you've been redeemed from that empty way of life, but not with perishable things, not with silver or gold. Nobody spent money to buy you back, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus, 
that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but we didn't really see him until these last times. And that's when he appeared. And through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead, and you give him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. And since you have purified yourself by your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly. Because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Now he says this about the word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a flower of the grass, and the grass withers, and the flower fades. Essentially he's saying everybody dies, everything that's new now is eventually going to be old. But he says this in verse 25, But the word of the Lord endures forever, and this word is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. So I want to look at a couple things in here about why the Bible's not a rule book. And first of all, if the Bible is a rule book, if the Bible is like what people in my church growing up used to say, basic instructions before leaving earth, well, you don't need rules for life after life is over, right? If, it, if the Bible is just rules for life, then you don't need it once you're dead. You don't need it once you're with God. But it says here in verse 25 that the Bible is going to last forever. What would we hang on to forever? Would we hang on to a rule book? Or would we hang on to a love letter? I'm still married to Darby. I'm very thankful for that. But you know what I hold on to? Love letters that she wrote me while we were dating. Why? I'm married. Because I still love to go back and see what she said about me. And when you're with God one day for eternity, you're still going to have this book and you're going to go back to it and say, he said these things about how he felt about me and now I'm with him, but I still love to go back and see what he said. The Bible is a love letter, not a rule book. The Bible is going to last forever. And then in verse 19, um, it says that... Um, we were ransomed by the blood of Jesus. Look back at 19. It says, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb, you were ransomed. You weren't ransomed. You didn't earn your place with God because you kept the rules. See, we want a, a spiritual rule book so that we can say that we're beating other people, so that we're a little bit better. But what does it say here? He says, oh no, none of you made it because you were keeping the rules. None of you made it because you had lots of silver or gold or money. He said the only reason any of you made it was because of Jesus. And so we're all equally in need of Jesus. And so I don't stand up here and say, I went to seminary. I've lived a pretty good life. So you guys need Jesus a little bit more than I do. Have you ever heard this when somebody's like, y'all need Jesus? You know, you need Jesus over there like because of their behavior. We all need Jesus. None of us is able to say, oh, I've been a little better at keeping these rules, and so I'm spiritually beating you because we're all only win one way, by Jesus. None of us win by keeping the rules. Jesus is the only one who wins. He's the only one that is unblemished, that had no sin. He just happens to love us so much. He says, if you want to share in my win, you can be a winner too. Remember when the Eagles won the Super Bowl? And everybody's like, we won! Like, no, you didn't. You weren't even there at the game. You definitely didn't play. But they're like, we won! They got to share in the win. Jesus has won. And he says, you want to share in my win? Become my follower. Become a student of the way that I lived and loved. And then in verse 18, it says, you were redeemed from the empty way of life that you inherited from your forefathers. The Jewish people thought, if we keep the rules, God will love us. If we keep the rules, God will love us. And what does uh, um, Peter say here? He says that was an empty way of life that was never going to be satisfied. He says, you've been redeemed, you've been rescued, you've been saved from rule-keeping by Jesus. That's grace. This undeserved kindness that God has shown us. He says, you don't have to keep the rules for me to love you. I love you despite your rule keeping. And so many times we go to this Bible and we're like, man, I've got to keep these rules and that way God will love me. He says, no, no, no. I love you even if you don't keep the rules. That's why I sent Jesus into the world. He says, but when we recognize his love and embrace his love, we begin to long to do good like he is good. When Darby writes me a love letter and she says, you are a good husband, 
That makes me want to be a good husband because I love her. When Darby says, I love how you stand up for me. And I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm like, I want to stand up for her. She thinks I'm a protector and I stand up for her. And I put, if she says, you put me first, I'm like, I need to put her first more. So that she says this more so that it, it becomes more true. Because sometimes she says things about me and I'm like, I'm really not that good at it. But it makes me long to become. And that's what the Bible does. God talks about how he sees us. And it makes us long to become like he says we are. In verse 22, it says, since you have been purified by your obedience to the truth, this is what happens. You show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart. You love one another constantly. See, a rule book makes us compete with each other. But a love letter compels us to love each other better. And I think this Bible is not a rule book where I'm like, I'm a little bit better than you because I'm keeping these rules better. I think it's a love letter that when I'm impacted by God's love for me, it begins to impact how I love you and how you love each other. See, love changes people's hearts. Rule books just change people's behavior. And I think for too long as churches, we focused on changing people's behaviors, even if their heart's not in it. So when I worked at an insurance company in Tennessee, there was this really stupid report they made us do after um, every file we processed, and it was pointless. It was a holdover from when we were on a paper system before a digital system. So it served no purpose anymore because the digital system automatically cataloged everything, but it was still part of the process. And so when I was like, why are we doing this redundancy? We don't need it. They're like, don't, we've just always done it, so don't mess with the system. Just keep doing this extra step. And I'm like, it's stupid. And they're like, you have to do it. We're going to go in and make sure that you're still doing it. And I'm like, it really serves zero purpose. And they're like, just keep doing it. And so I did it. But let me tell you this, my heart was not in it. And I think a lot of times our churches have given people a rule book, and yes, we've changed some of their behavior, but their heart has not been in it. But if we give people a love letter, it begins to change how we think about ourselves because we begin to see ourselves as God sees us, and it begins to change the desires of our heart. And when our desires change, our behaviors change. I love in the book of Ephesians, the first couple chapters, Paul just spends all this time saying, this is who you are as a follower of Jesus. You're a child. You're redeemed. He keeps saying all these identity things. And then in the second part of the book, he says, now because you are a son, you are a daughter, you ought to act this way. That's what a love letter does. It says, this is who I see you as. And once you embrace that, it begins to change what you do. So what do we do with this? First of all, I think we need to think about how we use the Bible. Do you wield the Bible like a weapon? You're probably using it like a rule book. Do you wield it like a love letter? Think about how you use the Bible. Do you take it and you hit people over the head with it and like, this is what you should be doing? That's probably, that might change their behavior. It probably won't, but it might. But will it change their heart? A love letter changes the heart. Think about how you approach the Bible. When you open up this Bible to read it or you pull up your app on your phone, do you approach it like a love letter? Like a lover wrote it to you? Or do you approach it like a textbook, like a rule book? Or do you look at it like a relationship book? When I come at this book, sometimes I'm so quick to think, what must I do? That's rule book thinking. Instead, what I need to do is, who does it say I am? Who must I become? Those are the questions that we ask of a love letter. And then finally, if this is a love letter, if we've been impacted by the love of Jesus, we need to begin to show love to other people. Think about this week. Like, how can I show the undeserved love that Jesus has shown to me to other people? How can I show people who don't deserve love? They probably deserve maybe even hate or they deserve hostility. But instead, I'm going to show them love because Jesus showed me love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the reminder that your Bible is not a rule book, it's a love letter. And Lord, I pray that you will help us approach this book with the right attitude, with the right heart, and recognize it's about our relationship with you and our relationship with others. And forgive us for how often we try to turn this book into a rule book instead of embracing the relationship that you offer us through it. Lord, I pray that you will give us opportunities to show radical, reckless love towards those who don't deserve it. And Lord, I pray that you will remind us of your love this week 
And Lord, I pray that as we open up this book, that we're not confronted with rules, but we recognize your love through it. And I pray all these things like I believe Jesus would. Amen.